Okay, testing. We good? Okay, awesome. Whew. Okay, welcome everyone and thank you for coming. My name is Alan Filonenko and I'm an engineering team lead at Bloomberg. And I'm joined here by my colleague, uh, um, Aki Sukagawa, who's a senior software engineer with me on the enterprise data science infrastructure team. So today we'll be talking about um, managing multi-cloud Apache Spark on Kubernetes. So in general, starting from the top, managing data science infrastructure in a multi-cloud environment is really hard. The variation of behavior between different hardware and cloud providers is vast and rather daunting. Now, Kubernetes in its cloud-native design provides an extraordinarily powerful abstraction across all these hardware stacks and enables the building of highly composable and transportable infrastructure substrates. This talk will, will be primarily focusing on that feature of Kubernetes as we're looking to address complicated, um, as, as looking to address complications that might arise, as, as specifically that we had when we ran a data science platform both on-prem and in various cloud environments like AWS EKS and Azure AKS. Given that Kubernetes um, as a foundational abstraction that we're using, we found that when designing various compute runtimes like Apache Spark, each of these runtime components require the same standard managed services, like we have here identity management, network policies, federated job APIs, and more. But in this talk in particular, we'll be focusing on the journey that we took to build out the Spark compute runtime within our data science platform. So what is Apache Spark? Um, show of hands, who is familiar here with Spark and who's not? Good. Okay, so there's a couple, okay, there's a couple, so we'll do a little bit of a rundown. So what is Apache Spark? So the quick background for those who are unfamiliar is that it's an ETL application that enables us to provide data science at scale. So traditionally, ETL for files smaller than the gigabyte uses pandas, but when we start scaling up to 100 gigabytes, we either need to chunk pandas data frames or use Dask, but Spark can also be a pretty good candidate. But where it really shines is when you start looking at petabytes or more. It has a variety of features that make it a powerful general execution engine, especially when communicating with cloud, uh, cloud object stores. But for the purpose of this talk, we'll be focusing on its distributed architecture and its relation to Kubernetes. Spark runs as independent processes on a cluster, coordinated by the Spark context object in your driver program. So Spark context can connect to several types of cluster managers, like Mesos, Yarn, or Kubernetes, for the, and for the, uh, for the purpose of allocating resources across applications. So Spark's cluster manager functionally is just purpose to provide IP addresses with which Spark uses them to communicate. So this enables the cluster managers to be rather flexible or composable for a variety of different scheduler backends like Yarn or Kubernetes. Now this has benefits for pluggability via scheduler interface, but this does mean that Spark isn't good at looking up or trying to bubble up too much Kubernetes information as it won't necessarily fit into the general interface. We call this kind of a lack of information flow. And this has a lot of drawbacks that we'll talk about throughout this talk. So upon receiving the provision executors, Spark sends the application code to the executors, after which then the Spark context would send tasks to the executors to run. Uh, the Spark context could, uh, could be initialized, for example, as a Jupyter notebook, as you can see kind of in the diagram, which means that the notebook pod would have a service account for directly creating executor pods. So if we were to parallelize the Kubernetes speak, we could kind of think of, of the driver here as a controller of sorts. It's now tasked with provisioning and managing state. However, this is all done from within Spark. Are folks familiar with con uh, controllers or Kubernetes controllers? Sweet. Now, what does it mean for, for a driver to have controller-like pr uh, privileges? So this means that the user's pod will have elevated service account privileges that in some environments, like ours at Bloomberg, is rejected due to security concerns. Some examples are, for example, some environments don't allow for users to create pods. Another potential problem is that the full information flow from Kubernetes is expected to reach Spark. But because of the agnostic nature of the scheduler, as I said earlier, this might not be entirely possible, and, we'll, and as, as we discussed a little bit earlier. So to solve this, Bloomberg, um, as I also talked about in my previous KubeCon talk, looked to enable a pluggable executor creation template that pushed the pod creation to an admin controller. So this allowed now for the communication with the admin controller um, to kind of push out that service account requirement. Now, uh, to communicate with, with controllers in general, this is traditionally done via custom resources. So this means that the Spark driver now modifies a custom resource instead of creating pods directly. So this moves the pod creation to an entity that doesn't share service accounts with the users. And that solves the first issue and could potentially fix information flow issues that might come up. But we'll get into that later. So to help understand this, let's work with a visual. Your driver pod, um, which in this example is running within the user's namespace from a, Jupyter note, from a Jupyter Notebook pod, would communicate with the API server to create and modify a Spark app custom resource. With the intention of having the controller and the admin namespace create those executors securely in the user's namespace. The admin controller will watch for Spark app custom resources, where the spec field of these custom resources has some desired state, 
In our case, we're, we're specifying uh, the expected executor pod templates. And the controller will then act um, on the contents of that spec field by creating these respective executor pods via its reconciliation loop. The driver will then wait for those executor pods asynchronously, which is functionally then the same as it would otherwise. So therefore, the rest of the Spark paradigm kind of remains the same, even with this pluggable design. Now, we've been running our personal fork of Spark in a managed data science platform across bare metal and various clouds for some time. So let's walk through a couple user studies that address the success stories and complications that arose. So let's start with all of our success stories. We've got a comment that it works. OK, now for what matters, the complications that arose. So without spending too much time on each of these issues, as you can review them and their solutions offline, I think we posted the slides. Um, what I want to highlight here, there are two categories of issues. One's relating to the pending status of the executors, and the other's relating to the failed states. Now, something to note is that these issues, when in a bare metal, non-autoscaling environment with a constrained resource quota, can vary from the pending issues that arise when running in the cloud with auto-scaling and preemptible spot instances. So to cater to both is quite challenging. Now, regarding failure scenarios, node scale down, preemption, and OMs, these are quite ubiquitous in Spark applications, especially in a large-scale Kubernetes cluster, and especially when you're running in the cloud. And so catering to all these variations of failures is another challenge. Now, Kubernetes, with its cloud-native resources, provides all the necessary information to cater to these problems across a multi-cloud environment, as you can see by the solutions to these complications. So we will generalize these problems and their respective solutions into three categories, and then show that by solving the information flow from Kubernetes to Spark, we can solve for most of the common user complications that have arisen in our platform. So the three generalized limitations that result from missing information flow include auto-scaling information, the capture of scale-down, preemption, OM, and failure events, and post-job um, introspection where a user might want to triage their, their Spark job after the job completes or fails. So this complements their existing monitoring or logging dashboards that might be available in their platform. So I'll now pass it over to Aki so that he can walk us through our approach and our solutions to addressing these limitations in Apache Spark. So our solution to the lack of information is to collect information ourselves somehow and uh, store high-level statistics into a uh, status object, uh, I mean, status field of the custom resource we described earlier. So as we, you can see in this slide, uh, missing or scaling information is now stored, I mean, will be stored in the cluster of scaling field on the right-hand side and uh, scale down and OOM out of memory failures, uh, information are stored in a terminated status field. And first, for positive introspection, we can keep the job object for a while and uh, query this object. And this is how it will look like. So we build a controllers to collect the necessary information somehow and aggregate it as high-level statistics and make it available in the Spark app custom resource for each Spark app or context. We can, for example, build a UI on top of the information we gather from the custom resource or bubble up the information to the Jupyter notebook that is running the driver program. So we could directly collect the information and provide an endpoint to get the statistics in one service. Uh, there's nothing wrong with this approach, but uh, we prefer having a separate component for just collecting the information inside the Kubernetes world. So by having a controller to collect information from underlying Kubernetes layer, we have a nice separation of concern. And also, we can follow a common controller pattern for uh, handling Kubernetes objects. So what does it mean? So as we saw earlier, we used the Spark app custom resource for creating executor pods. So in the control pattern, the spec field represents the desired state, desired state of the world, and the status field is the represented state of the world. So control app tries to represent the desired state and uh, re represent back the actual uh, rep uh, uh, realized state. So uh, we are following the controller pattern here uh, when we store the statistics about the executors to the status field back. So other con considerations about the controller pattern itself is that uh, its reconciliation loop needs to be uh, it important, uh, meaning that it needs to be stateless. It can't rely on the previous results. So it works from scratch every time the reconciliation loop is invoked. <laughs> 
So another way to think about this approach is that we are effectively using the custom resource as a data, data store for the high-level statistics we want. Uh, we are effectively storing information to SCD uh, via Kubernetes API server. So here's the characteristics uh, of, of this approach as a data store. So it, it introduces no uh, extra dependency, and it provides an out-of-the-box pub-sub mechanism via watch. And we can do basic query and aggregation via uh, selectors and uh, controllers. And latency is not ideal, but uh, it's not too high as well. So we can expect an order of a second latency. And in the, not to mention its uh, availability is really excellent. Since we are providing high-level statistics in the uh, we want to push updates via long polling or WebSocket. Uh, so we want pub-sub mechanism in the data store. And the users are not clicking or something and, or, and actively waiting for the res response. The latency requirement uh, for our UI is not so tight. And we only need a basic query mechanism in this case, in our use case. And since uh, we run it in a bare metal and uh, multiple cloud, uh, cloud services, we really want to minimize extra dependencies in our case uh, because the maintenance cost and the complexity in each environment add up. So there are there were two alternatives we considered as a data store. One is that uh, our external log metric services such as Humio or Splunk, uh, which we already use for our debugging purposes, they are excellent for uh, retrospective troubleshooting via ad hoc queries. Uh, but the building real-time UI on top of this is not really trivial, and also latency is uh, of concern as they are they are typically backed by S3 storage uh, to uh, handle a large amount of data. So, uh, Another way uh, we thought about is to use an additional database. Uh, this is certainly doable, but uh, it introduces extra infrastructure, and we also need to choose a solution carefully and design on top of it with care as well. So as we saw, uh, we are effectively choosing SCD for our database for the advantages listed before. Now that we have uh, proposed using a custom resource uh, to store executors high-level statistics, uh, let's walk through each of the limitations in information flow we identified earlier. We will start with auto-scaling. So what is auto-scaling up? So cluster auto-scaling up uh, happens when existing node, existing Kubernetes nodes cannot uh, fit in newly created pods. So if th there's not enough nodes already, the cluster or scalar tries to create more nodes. So when it happens, uh, there are actually two problems from the perspective of us Spark user experience. Firstly, it takes much longer than usual pod initialization. And, if it, and secondly, it's not always possible. Uh, for example, if the user is not allocated enough quota for AWS or Azure resources. Uh, so without knowing this uh, underlying cluster, knowing this underlying cluster scale-up status, Spark users will be left wondering why their requested executors don't come up, and are they going to ever come up, or uh, whether they need to inform cluster, admi cluster administrators for help, or things like that. So now that we know how cluster or scalar works and why it's useful for our users, we are going to actually collect information to detect their status. So if we are running a standard cluster or scalar implementation provided by Kubernetes, uh, that particular implementation uh, will inform us about cluster scaling up uh, via event objects. Um, it creates an uh, event object uh, with the reference to the affected pod, like uh, shown in the slide. And they create a, uh, so the, the, the reference is in the involved object field. So one reason we chose to run a standard cluster scalar, by the way, was because of our multi-cloud environment and the uh, desire to keep a single implement implementation across all deployments. So this is another example for when a cluster scale up was impossible. So the last one was for scaling up was possible and triggered. And we can 
so the, we can detect cluster outscaling state uh, of each executor pod by listing these events from cluster autoscaler involving the particular pod and pick the latest one. So we can have one controller watching pods and the cluster autoscaler events and aggregate all the information into Spark Up custom resource. And a minor concern here is that the reconciliation loop is about the Spark App spanning all the executors in the Spark App context. And the one reconciliation loop will go through the pods of the app and also the events of each pod in the app. And on top of this, the autoscaler event can be repeated and can cause spike of incoming updates and can potentially make the controller less responsible at the time. So we can separate the concern by introducing another controller nicely. So the additional controller works on uh, cluster autoscaler events exclusively and store the cluster autoscaling status information uh, of the affected pod. Uh, I mean, the status into the affected pod itself. And the main controller only watches pods. Simple. And uh, uh, this is possible because we can dynamically store additional information to pod itself. Uh, so how we do this? So one way is to put the custom label or annotation to the pod. We define an arbitrary custom label name and put arbitrary information with some constraints. And another less known way is to put the custom condition to the pod status field. We can define a custom condition type with additional field with more flexible constraint. Now that we handle the scale up, the next problem is that we will work on is a cluster auto scaling down and out of memory. The information source we need here is actually the same as before. The cluster auto scale down information is provided in the exact same way as cluster auto scale up. And out of memory information can be already found in the pod itself in a terminated status uh, in the pod status field. So the uh, same pods and the events are the information sources. However, the challenge here is that the, since these pods have failed already, uh, they can be deleted. As we are following the control patterns, we need all the information sources available at the time of reconciliation because uh, control is stateless and it needs to be uh, idempotent, important as uh, I covered before. So one way to deal with this deletion is not to delete pod in the first place. So there is a relevant option introduced in Spark 3.0 uh, that prevents uh, Spark drivers from de deleting failed executor pods. By default, uh, Spark de driver deletes failed pods, but uh, by setting uh, this deleted, uh, delete on termination option to false, uh, it leaves the failed pods as, as they are. So this solved the majority of the problem, and it, this solved the issue for out-of-memory error. But this only prevents Spark driver from killing uh, pods, and there are others who can kill executor pods. For example, in the case of a cluster auto scale down or eviction, uh, pod will be deleted by Kubernetes uh, core components, uh, not drivers. So it's not uh, prevented by the above config. It turns out that uh, even for those cases, we can actually prevent the deletion by using a Kubernetes finalizers. Uh, finalizers is a, a field in the metadata, and uh, it's just an array of strings. And as long as it's not empty, the object cannot be deleted. So we can put a custom arbitrary finalizer there and prevent the executor pod from being deleted as long as we want. We did not choose this approach because the scope of the implication is really hard to know. Pod is such a central component of Kubernetes, and so many types of resources are attached to it uh, that it is very hard to foresee every single edge cases uh, we can face down the road. So we decided that we cannot keep the pod resource itself. Uh, we need to store the information somewhere. So given the previous considerations about the data source, uh, another custom resource in SCD is a natural fit. So now the pod status controller watches the executor pods and the cluster autoscaler events and the store necessary information into new pod status uh, custom resource. So we just created it. 
So it's worth note uh, in this diagram that uh, some of the executor pods may be deleted, and so they won't exist in SCD anymore, which is why this pod set as custom resources is necessary. Uh, this is uh, indicated in a dashed circle. So the Spark App Controller will now watch uh, pull status objects in, instead of managing aggregated status. So the main controller is still watching the single uh, object. So this is what uh, pull the status custom resource actually looks like. Uh, we follow the common pattern of uh, spec and the status field here. And uh, spec is a, a desired state, and the status is the realized state. And in this case, it's kind of a little bit, uh, vari it's a variant of that. Uh, spec field specifies the target pod to track in the object, and the controller replicates the necessary information into the status field, meaning that the status field itself is the realized uh, state. So we can selectively activate this functionality for a single pod by creating one pod status object like this. So optionally, we can have a separate webhook or a controller on top of this, and they automatically create such pod status object for each pod uh, that matches certain criteria. Uh, like in Spark, there, are, there is a requirement that all executor pods have a uh, label, Spark role equals executor. So in this example, in the example configuration in the slide, if a pod has the Spark role equals executor, a corresponding pod status object will be automatically created. And then the controller will be watching that and uh, keep updating uh, relevant information from uh, event and the pod into those pod status. So now it looks like uh, we are copying field values around only from the one object type to another. So we might as well make it more generic and describe it by uh, declarative field copying specs. So this is an alternative design of the pulse status controller. So in the, for this controller, we have a configuration like this. And uh, in the left-hand side, we specify the source and destination field declaratively, and the type, of course. And the controller will watch the source objects and keep replicating specified fields. Resulting destination object in this case uh, is shown in the right hand side, and the, the owner reference field and the container status field is replicated. And this is another example uh, for the cluster all scalar event. Uh, we, uh, on, top, on top of the previous one, we also let the controller watch events uh, with the configuration watch, and a cluster uh, the replicate and <laughs> and replicate the latest fields values from the cluster all scalar event to the destination uh, status object. So our implementation of this approach is powered by an unstructured type uh, in a client Go, and it's actually quite lightweight. Uh, it's, let's say, like several hundreds of line of code, uh, Go code, and it might be even more straightforward in Kubernetes clients in dyna dynamic languages. A downside of this approach is that uh, everything becomes a Go map in the implementation, and uh, we lose static typing. You might want to do more than just copying, for example, define more complicated trigger rule and have more volatile actions triggered by those rules, not just copying, etc. And it's totally possible and not that hard to do, but we would recommend to keep the configuration like this uh, really simple, as you don't really want to, for example, unit test YAML configuration down the road. So one realization from this experimental uh, implementation is that this way we can really make sure that the additional control additional controller, the Apollo status controller, only does the copying and nothing else. So it can be good design pattern or discipline to follow in certain use cases. So in other words, you can make sure that all the business logic resides in the main controller and not randomly spread across uh, multiple places. But in our use cases, uh, we actually wanted to encapsulate autoscaler related logic into uh, additional controller, the Apollo Sales controller. So uh, we didn't uh, choose this route. 
so as a recap, uh, now that we've walked through uh, providing uh, auto scaling information and the various failure scenarios by fixing, fixing the information flow to Spark, we can look back at the Spark app custom resource and know how it was produced. Regarding the persistence of Spark app information for the purpose of postage of inspection, uh, we went through various storage options uh, with the conclusion that the custom resource is the effective candidate for our multi-cloud environment. So building up on we, what we talked about in this presentation, uh, similar features can be implemented, implemented in other distributed execution systems such as PyTorch or TensorFlow that rely on Kubernetes as a resource manager. In that case, the power status controller will be uh, reusable as is, and the main co job controller can handle uh, job type specific statistics uh, apart from that. Why the autoscaler detection behavior by uh, event objects uh, is specific to the standard cluster autoscaler, uh, we can actually switch uh, to alternative autoscalers such as Carpenter uh, without affecting the main job controller now by only switching detection logic uh, inside the policy status controller. So this is especially useful if you, we have uh, multiple job types and multiple main job controllers. So uh, that's it. So feel free to check out the rest of our talks from Bloomberg and uh, uh, check out, also check out the links below to learn more about us. And uh, by the way, we are hiring. <laughs> Thank you for that. So do we have any questions for this? Yeah, there's Ooh. a question, of course. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the presentation. How do you manage the data? I mean, in a multi-cloud environment, how do you manage the different aspect of the, the data? Isolation, security, do you share the data? How do you run Spark in multi-cloud with different type of data, different type of teams? Got it, so is general data management, do you guys hear me? Sorry, general data management questions? Um, yeah, the context of the talk is mostly about the compute, but in terms of data, it varies between like the restrictions and the security concerns of the application. Like if it's something where um, we're taking data that's only within a certain like say network we're we're constricting it to, we'd have like Calico or Cilium policies locking everything down in terms of moving data in and out, right? And so it, it varies based on the implementation. So the platforms itself are composable, so they vary with security concerns. So. But, but but if you run the same pod in different places, you have to share the data. You have to have only one place or different place. So when you see, when you say the, okay, <laughs> um, the pods themselves are on the user's namespace, right? And so the data itself is either collocated in the namespace or you have specific um, verification on what data source you're communicating to. So the pods themselves are always the user namespace, the admin controllers are just a control plane, right? The pods are not in the control plane, it's only in the user's namespace for the Spark app. Does that answer the question? Okay, so I, yeah, there was one behind. Hey, I have two questions. The first one is um, you had on-prem data center footprint, you had AWS and GCP. So I was curious if all the cluster compute nodes on all these three footprints across cloud providers, are, are they homogeneous? or do you have heterogeneous uh, compute environments? So homogeneous in terms of the hardware types, like CPU, GPU, that yes. kind of stuff? Yes, yeah, yeah. Got it, got it. So um, in terms of Spark, we, there are NVIDIA plugins that allow you to run GPU, um, and so it's based on, once again, the configuration of the cluster. The, the infrastructure itself is portable, um, so functionally, yes, it, it, it could be, Ooh, yeah. Thanks, and the second question is, I'm curious to learn, uh, if you built cluster autoscaler before Carpenter was announced, or what were the reasons for for building it in house uh, versus using an, another open source project? Do it. Yeah. So uh, I, I, the we were using the standard cluster autoscaler from Kubernetes. Right. The intention, right. Um, as Aki mentioned, was that because we're in a multi-cloud environment and we right. need portable infrastructure, Got the built-in standard cluster autoscaler is something that would run in. EKS, AKS, and on bare metal because it's all Kubernetes abstraction. Right. So we just use the base cluster autoscaler, so we didn't build our own, but the idea is 
because we have a separation of concerns between the job controllers that reconcile however that job operates and the auto scaling information, the auto scaler, the auto scaling controller could have either the cluster auto scaler events or it could use Carpenter's way of doing it or God, whatnot. yeah, thank you. Uh, and the last question. Um, so I guess, like, because you're using etcd, like, as kind of a database, I'm curious if you, like, hit any scaling or performance constraints, and if you did any testing on that sort of thing. It seems kind of like pod statuses are just created, um, and I imagine it'll pile up over time. Um, so with regards to kind of um, considerations, so traditionally it's kind of about, like, what is your Spark app clusters, like, scale to, right? Like, we had some battle tests, I think 400 and 500 uh, kind of executor clusters, and that's kind of what I've seen mostly like sub 1,000. I don't really know too many have more than 1,000 kind of executor pods. So obviously, yeah, if you're talking about very large, it's always about numbers, but how much you can store in that CD. Um, we found that it kind of fit within our models of you know, 400, 500 pod clusters. Um, I mean, we can talk offline in terms of like other kind of maybe, you know, strategy tests in terms of actual like sizing itself, but it seems to fit for most applications that we're running in prod. Thank you. Thank you.